Hello and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by FinPro Search Partners, the executive search form for the insure tech industry on an international basis. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to hear a bit more about our recruitment services, please visit www.wearefinpro.com. I hope you enjoy the episode. Good morning and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance Podcast podcast. I'm your host Alex Bond and I'm very lucky today to be joined by David King who is a CCO of Artificial. Um, David, good, well it's good morning in podcast land. Um, how are you? I'm great and thank you ever so much for having me on the podcast. It was, uh, it's made my day, week, year to be thought of as a, a leader in in this industry that we work in. So yeah, very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for the invite. No, good stuff. Well, look, thank you for coming on board. And, and, and I always say I've got a soft spot for artificial because one of my best friends works there. So, and he's worked there a very long time. Um, and off air. So you, nepotism works then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's alive and well in the insurance industry. Good thought it. Um, but um, but no, before I leap ahead and obviously being close, that you know, I'm aware of um, the artificial business and have been for some time, but it's always great to hear from, from yourself you know, explaining your role and, and, and obviously uh, the, the sort of solution that Artificial is offering. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm David King. I'm the co-founder of Artificial and we are an insure tech focused on algorithmic underwriting. Uh, I have to stop myself being a geek and jumping down a rabbit hole of technically what that means, what it doesn't mean and everything else. But I think in the in its simplest sense, we enable an insurer to receive data through any channel and by any channel i mean via email uh, via api via a portal that type of thing and to digitize and structure that data as it hits their organization and make a decision taking into account any data set system that they need to in order to come to a decision and that decision isn't removing uh, that decision isn't made with the com- human completely removed the decision is, yes, we can automate this. No, we can't. And we're going to put it in front of a human for, their to, for them to add their ultimate wisdom, but with all of the data available to make that decision quickly and readily at hand, or it's just a straight up no. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, are you say we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but I kind of think it would be quite fun to go down that rabbit hole, but we'll, I think we'll come back to that in a second because artificial business that's been... Um, in inception since what, 2013 and then working with insurers at, at 2015 what was before that I'm, I'm sort of intrigued I, I know very little about the 2013 to 2015 bit so was the what was the business focus that was it sort of more industry agnostic and solving a sort of broader solution so the, the solution wasn't dissimilar to what we do now but it was taking data from hard to reach places and making processes very efficient and we did that for a number of different brands. So the household name brands, in the a lot of them were in the consumer sector. So cars, uh, retail, fashion, that type of thing, airlines, betting companies. And it, and it was always uh, around the same challenge, which was they had data. They wanted to provide a great customer experience. That data needed to be received. It would come through various different channels. And they had to manipulate the data in different ways in order to come to it an automated decision and put it in front of a person. Now, whilst that was exciting for us to work in, to work with these guys, because they were in different industries, every time we would have to do something slightly different. And that meant we didn't really have a product. We would, we were solutionizing or providing a service to these different companies. And, it, and at that stage, we were, we weren't an investment backed business or a, a VC backed business. So we were having to earn the money to pay, for what we were building and we were a little bit naive in that we were a bunch of geeks that just really wanted to do these platforms for these companies because that really excited us Mm. i think the the growing up part of the business was around 2015 2016 when we wanted to focus on one industry build a platform make a difference and build and compound our insight technological technology capabilities and point of difference over time and we chose insurance there was a little bit of an overlap, but essentially all of the clients that weren't insurance clients at that point uh, were parked and we focused on being an insurance company. And that was when we went on a on a journey that also required a VC backing because we weren't 
uh, able, I think, to compete with the insure techs or the software providers in the insurance industry, starting from from scratch without that investment backing. Mm-hmm. Makes sense, and 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 even from twenty fifteen, uh, I mean, this might be outside looking in, but it seems like there's sort of multiple solutions and products that were kind of spun up. Um, it makes sense now. You're saying thematically, they're all sort of driving towards the same problem of of, of accessing complex data. Uh, there's a sort of t- couple of things that spring to mind. Is there something unique about the insurance industry that makes that a challenge? Is is it the scale of data, the data or, or or the specific language? Is is there something unique to the industry that makes that particularly challenging? Because it's obviously fairly long in the tooth. Where other other industries have come to these solutions slightly earlier. Mm-hmm. I think that there are good reasons why you would want to apply technology to the insurance industry and there are reasons why it has been slower. And I think that there's also a split, a big oversimplification here between kind of competitive commercial lines and, uh, sorry, competitive personal lines and commercial lines. So competitive personal lines, I think, have deployed technology at a faster rate. I think that's an an obvious one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas the probably the explanatory variable of profitability in commercial lines for a long time has been do they make money do they write good risks or not or does the wind blow or on things like that is not necessarily being are they as efficient as possible i think over time they've realized that having technology deploying technology to make themselves more efficient and having the data in a state that they can use it to to effectively analyze what's driving profitability has helped a lot now what i'm I'm, i've gone off on a bit of a tangent so if i think back to what the original question was of does it is insurance a particularly difficult place to do that? I think because of the the reason that people haven't thought that they, they needed the efficiency to, to make money in commercial insurance for a long time, you've ended up having companies with data that resides in a lot of different places. There hasn't been the kind of API connectivity that you get in other industries or in personal lines. And plugging that together, started, like there, there had to be a painful process or a, 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 a maturing a maturity process that needed to take place in order to get us to where i think we, where we are now where if you if a u.s commercial property underwriter says to us we need to do sanctions checking exposure checking sov ingestion all of that type of thing you can do that now and you can do it and it's relatively straightforward to do it but you probably couldn't have done it five years ago because there wasn't the ability to plug in via api to a sanction service or exposure service or a, a enrichment data service mm, sure and is that you know, from an artificial's perspective, because I, I, it was very pointed in, for me just reading the, the insurance press, um, knowing the kind of you had this suite of products, and then and then when the latest raise news came out, it was like um, artificial, you know, algorithmic underwriting insure tech. That was kind of how it was kind of presented, and I thought, well, that's very definitive. Um, and I was going to say, you know, was that a pivot into that, or was it sort of a natural evolution? And it's sounds to me that I'm leaning towards natural evolution because it's like the rest of the tech has caught up so now you can offer that as a service whereas previously it might not have been but that's that's just my very simplified view from the outside but um it's probably I think that that is true that the ecosystem that exists today allows for algorithmic underwriting Mm -hmm. we still have to uh, meet the market where it is today by doing ingestion. So MRC ingestion and SOV ingestion are, are two areas whereby, and emails, whereby you couldn't, I don't think you could operate as an insurer across a broad range of products and not <laughs> or generate enough submission flow without being able to do those things. And so I'm, I'm very poorly saying that you need to do those things in order to, to make your business efficient because that's how the business arrives at to you uh in terms of our own progression and why we ended up focusing on that i think because we were a service company historically and we made the bold decision to just focus on insurance we thought we had focused a lot but then when we started engaging with insurers and brokers and mgas we would still interact with them like a service company which essentially means we do what they asked us to do and we got pulled in a lot of directions and we got pulled to that. And, and this was a consequence of a doing a good job a lot of the time. So if you were doing an underwriting piece and then they were saying, well, we can use you for the policy management system, actually. Oh, we can use you for the claims automation. Automating claims is just the same as automating 
submissions when they arrive and underwriting them automatically that you're taking data into account to make a, a decision with a confidence level. Oh, uh, why can't you automate our complaints? And it's very difficult as well when we were dealing with really large brokers and underwriters that were our first customers and we were really keen to build up a good reputation to say no. Mm. Uh, I think over time what we realised was that we were going to end up be, being very thinly spread across all of this different functionality and whilst different comp- uh, teams within these large companies really liked us because we weren't effectively becoming their in-house team that did anything they want for them we weren't building a platform that had differentiation Mm. at scale Mm. so we thought okay then if we're going to focus on one area where should we focus and that was what led itself to algorithmic underwriting because there was something i think i mentioned earlier you are digitizing and structuring data as it enters organization which has benefits across the organization there because you have you can share it with finance you can share it with the claims team, you can share it with everybody else, dashboarding teams, BI, wherever. But also, I think that helps the, the business pull two very specific levers. So your efficiency or your cost or expense ratio is going to be lower because you are reducing the amount of time that you're spending on that underwriting process. And then you also make the data available for the analysis of understanding what, what's driving profitability. So over time, your loss ratio. So this seemed to us to be pivotal. I'm not trying to undermine the value of the other components of the the, the, insur- the insurance businesses, but we thought that this is this is where we've got a, a lot of insight. This lends itself well to the team and the technology that we've developed. Mm-hmm. And then there was another really uh, key challenge is that every kind of underwriting team wants things done slightly differently. So they want to use a different set of data, a different rating. Sometimes the rating engine exists in Microsoft Excel. Sometimes it exists on another platform. Sometimes the actuarial team have developed a, a Python model. So we needed a way that we could very quickly configure the, the way that the algorithm on the platform is going to behave tailored to that use case. And that's why we had to, to, to invest heavily in a, our own domain specific language and our and our own way to configure that use case and then you've got and then it built upon it because then you're targeting it to the to the portfolio of that particular product and then the portfolio for the the whole organization so it's not just making an assessment on a submission on a standalone basis but does this fit with the portfolio of the product does it fit with the portfolio of business and allowing that that portfolio manager to then play around with it, play around with the parameters, and how would that impact the the overall performance of the organisation or the changes to the, the portfolio you're actually going to end up with? So mm-hmm. that was a very long winded, I think, explanation of why we ended up with algorithmic underwriting. I'm a massive believer in simplifying things, probably because I'm a simple person. And if you think of an insurer that takes more data into account in order to make a decision over time should make better decisions sure. and that's where i think we can we we speak to yeah no there's a couple of things in there that i think are really pertinent and and i think specifically the the venture rounds um you know something that was fed back to me on about it was kind of obvious when when you say it but but one of the i think the challenges that you're not aware of if you're not going for this phase of raising money and, it, and it's similar to what you were saying about being a company from a service industry and then trying to operate and basically trying to productize. And I have massive empathy for that because I, I feel like about myself, I turn up and I know what my product is in the recruitment space and this is how I operate. And then sometimes you're going to end up you know, muddy in the waters and working the way your client does. And then then that's kind of where the risk is on delivery. But um, that kind of pull to different customers, different demands, they're big customers, they're writing big checks, is the same as the kind of venture rounds. And someone, um, and I forget who it was now, sadly, but was coming on as one of the biggest challenges of going through and raising money is that everyone's got an opinion on your product or service. And you have to be yeah. malleable enough to take the good bits on board, but then stick true to your, your core offering. Um, and that's one of the challenges. It sounds like that was, you know, that's the challenge when you're kind of in this service mentality and you've got your big clients. It's kind of some of the same pressures. So sort of sticking to that, right, this is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to sort of offer as a solution is, is very difficult because, yeah, when you're scrapping, it's pretty hard to say no. <laughs> yeah. And I think when you're going through venture funding rounds, which and we've been through a couple now and uh, different degrees of interest from the, the VCs. To your point. A lot of the VCs will offer you opinions Mm -hmm. and understanding which ones are valid or not, not just because who's smart, but 
English people are polite as well. So English people rarely would say to you, I'm not investing in you because you, the team's rubbish or you lack credibility or the, just giving you a straight answer like that. They're always going to come up with something. So are they making up a reason or are they giving you a, a decent reason to start off with? And then the second level, of, if you believe that they're giving you an honest reason, do they know what they're talking about? Now, I'm not suggesting that they don't know what they're talking about in terms of the C world, and I'd, I w- wouldn't want to question anybody, any VCs on whether they understood the kind of like the financing that goes on behind the scenes in their fund, but more specifically in short tech. And we've had such a broad range of feedback on what's good, bad, indifferent, that I think it is difficult to know who's credible and who's not. And I think we're fortunate enough to have very smart VCs that give us great advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I think that like following that through of who do you take the money on? Because then you've got to, to listen to them on a regular basis. So it's it's good to be able to be in a position as well where you can choose people that you get on well with. And we were really fortunate that the the VC firm that led our last round, we had a relationship with them for a for a long time so that we knew knew how they operated. We really liked them and uh yeah, we're we're really glad to to have them on board. Mm. And the other the other thing I want to pick up from um from the previous thing about why algorithmic underwriting is is that you know getting into that and I think you touched on it so I just wanted to bring that out really is because I think the fear with algorithmic underwriting is is well, where do you put your where's your USP where's your edge where do you create your edge if everyone's kind of oper- offering this kind of algorithmic underwriting piece um yep. so I suppose two things like there's a protectionism there and and i've i've actually just delivered a project on someone building a building an in-house functionality for this an in-house team um and it was more of a scoping project to see if it could be done um but why shouldn't they build it themselves or or you know um i'm part i I feel like i'm tearing you up and open goal there i don't know but um but (laughs) but i think that is because there's definitely two rules of thought of building it in, in-house themselves and then there's starting to sort of be services. Um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to get your opinion and, and uh, clearly you've got best interest, but you're obviously at the cold face of why should, someone should or shouldn't. And, and I suppose following on from that, which I think makes it interesting, is how do they build in their edge, you know, if everyone's kind of utilising the same technology? So first and foremost, I would say that they should build it themselves if they believe they can operate like a tech company. So if you are a another insurance company, you have more resource, more data than most of the insure techs. So let's just say you are one of the top performing syndicates or even a, a mid ranking syndicates in the Lloyd's market, you're gonna have more money than we've got. Yeah. If you're prioritizing the money that you've got and the resource you've got to operate like a tech company, so I think in reality, they don't end up having more money than we've got to focus on technology because they are not first and foremost a technology company. So any resource that they have focuses on their area of differentiation, which is being an insurance company and doing all the things that an insurance company do. But if they were to wake up one morning, probably take longer than a morning because they need approval from about 57 different boards and <laughs> and stakeholders etc but if they could operate like a tech company they can go all in and i think there are examples of this where it has worked that is a good idea for them but it's not also it's not just building your platform and then you park it it's building the platform and then maintaining it and evolving it and ensuring that it it evolves as the market evolves which probably brings me so that is a cultural change in an organization and mm-hmm. I think big organizations struggle to to change, to operate like a, a startup, don't they? Hence, startups exist. If they were really good at it across the board, then you wouldn't have uh, as many successful startups as you do. I, I also take the point that loads of startups fail, but it's slightly mm-hmm. different. The, yeah. So if they're gonna if they can change their culture to operate like that, then I would say fantastic. And then on the technology area. I think you can execute definitive areas of algorithm underwriting relatively quickly. So you could maybe put a team together 
spend X million pounds and put algorithmic underwriting together for a product line or a couple of product lines if you were an insurer. Now, that would then allow you to stand in front of your board and say, we've written, I don't know, 50 million pounds in premium and we've done it algorithmically and we plugged into all these different systems to make it happen. Isn't it fantastic? Have they done it in a way that is scalable, that you can aggregate all the data points across every product that you've got? It's going to be relatively straightforward to make it compliant with CDR when that comes into effect. Have you been able to attract the fantastic talent that is required to do that like there is a massive difference and this is something we struggled with for a long time and hence we had to allow a team to go off for two years and build that real point of differentiation which is the, now at the core of everything we do thankfully we did that years and years ago so it's not a problem now but if you were if you were going to do it the right way the way a startup is going to do it, i think you would have to change the culture and then you'd also have to think right we're going to have to just sink money into something for a couple of years without it, it popping its head up because i think that the real danger if you're an insurer is you don't change the culture you don't have the team with the resource you then do mvp because you're agile and you're going to act like a tech company you make the mvp that they then put into production they if that's a success everyone goes Everyone's very happy. Yay. Brilliant. And then you roll it out across three products. And then they say, we want to roll it out across six products. And it's almost like starting again because it's not scalable, repeatable. Mm -hmm. And then the cost compounds. And then people say to you, well, this isn't actually saving us any money because we've got more people than we had before. The technology's not scalable. So we're having to continually invest in it. We're not seeing the benefits. And now the CDR is coming along and we've got, we've, we've got to do that. It's clashing with other priorities that the tech team's having to run because the, this tech team's probably run out of IT as well, I'm guessing, or innovation or something like that. And there are other endeavours that they have to do. And I think that it it ends up compounding the friction. I don't want to steal terms off of other people that are smarter than me that have written, written better books than me, but you're going to have a massive tech debt at some point. And I don't think that tech debt ever gets paid. Mm -hmm. So... If you can come back to the start, though, I would also I would be a massive advocate of tech companies building it. But I'm oh, sorry, insurance companies building the tech. But are they going into the adventure with their eyes open? And in the same way as if you were to say to a tech company, build an insurer, there are going to be lots of things that unknown unknowns about that. So we're going to say, right, we're going to need an underwriting plan. They're going to have to have X, Y, and Z. We're going to have to have various different forecasts that get approved by very different various different stakeholders but i think you can employ people to fix those questions yeah whereas i think an insurance company employing the tech people that have got a seat at the table that can ensure that the the right path is followed is very difficult Mm. And, and, I, and just to sorry I'll very yeah. quickly finish is i've got I, I got given an example by someone the other day for a large syndicate in london that was was thinking of not building their own tech but changing the way that they wrote business on a particular line mm -hmm. and they were sitting around the table and one of the insurers said we can't do this for six months because there's a market change happening and i know i can make x million pounds over doing something slightly different so i won't tell you what the different thing was but it wasn't a tech thing yeah, yeah. And so they said, I'm going to do this and we're going to make X million pounds. And I basically need to use my human skills to make that happen. And of course, the board said, I'll do that. And then we'll do the tech thing in six months time. Yeah. But yeah. in six months time, there will be another thing. Yeah. And they're yeah. always going to go with the insurance person saying, listen to me, I can make us another X million pounds. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's I found it fascinating because as, as you as you were talking, I was thinking, well, one, I always think build versus buy. I think it's always buy once the buy option is effective, efficient, proven, and realistic, but probably has a bit of competition out there, which kind of means the kind of price is, is, is at the right point. Um, but you have to be awareness of what price is fair because so you almost have to look internally to go, well, what, what could we do this? Um, and but your 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 point was really interesting to me about um if they if insurance companies can think like technology companies. Because we've clearly seen very publicly technology companies trying to create insurance companies. And it doesn't seem to work either way. So, you know, I used to work at RSA. 
we went on some massive claim system they were trying to build, built it ourselves, absolute disaster. Um, I, I can't remember how long it was in play for, but not very long at all. And there was a huge spend on it. Um, probably could have gone bought something off the shelf that would work much, much nicer. We've seen the sort of big, some of the big insure techs fallen over and they haven't fallen over because their tech's not great. Everyone says the tech's great, the customer experience is brilliant, but basically the underwriting's not gone very well um, and the risk management. So it, there is definitely a play in your own ball pit, really. Um, and I, and I think the I think the big insure text that you know that's the thing that really kind of brings it home is because you know, the tech has been unquestionably better. Um, but even then, we're looking at some of the more mature insure techs now. And and I've just come back from ITC in Vegas. We we're in Vegas, and we're talking that they are they are having to deal with other partner insure techs because they've already built up tech debt. And and we're talking about five year old insurance companies, but because they've got scale and they've got underwriting decisions at scale. They're now having to kind of outsource some of their kind of tech solutions. So, um, yeah, I, I find this interesting because every time a new thing comes up, there's always people going, well, maybe we'll just buy, build it ourselves. And you go, well, like you say, you can't constantly invest in the R&D of a tech, you know, and, look, and looking at new skills in tech, et cetera, um, like a tech company can. Um, and, that, and that's even if you can get the culture right. So, um, but something I want to pick up on your last point about this, this underwriting, which is a really interesting one for me, is that what do you think algorithmic underwriting means for the role of the underwriter? And I think specifically in the London market, because you know, the underwriter is still king. So what does that, what do you think that means in terms of how that changes? Uh, so I would, I think the easy answer is to say straight away, they will focus on their portfolio and they will be more efficient and they will be able to do 10 times the amount of business. So I think those things are all true, but like the, the insurance company trying to build tech, that underwriter needs to have a mindset change and think, uh, okay, then if I'm going to use technology and I'm not going to do all of the things that I was doing before, let, let's say for argument's sake, so that 75% of my time was set up collating, analyzing, uh, putting data into different systems, getting it for that might be more the assistant end than the actual underwriter. But you are doing things that are not adding value. So the mindset change of what can I do that adds value? And I think paradoxically, a little bit of it is relationships. So the, the underwriter needs to be really good and they need to have great relationships both inside and outside the business. So inside the business, if you've got a uh, a data team that's doing all sorts of complicated analysis to understanding what's driving profitability, having a great relationship with them and being able to talk to them in a way that you understand what they're saying and how that should impact your portfolio and how you're going to execute that algorithmically or otherwise with your different distribution partners. And then having the relationships with your distribution partners, because one, let's say we fast forward X years and everybody's operating with a super efficient algorithmic platform why would a broker plug into one or the other? Is it just completely price driven or can you design product that or a combination of products that gets you to the front of the queue? So the, the broker sends you the, the risks, the submissions that, that are relevant to you. And again, that might be you're having a conversation with someone in the broking side that is not a traditional broker and it's a different kind of conversation. So you might be having a more of a technical conversation with the broker of, okay, then you're you're trying to optimize for X and this is why our product fits that at the right price when you look into the detail of it. So I think a, a lot of what I'm saying is a, a mixture of technical expertise. So more of the, the portfolio design, product design, integration, efficiency, and then also with using the time that's been freed up because you're using loads of technology to focus on where can I use my human side to make a big difference? And I think that's yeah, relationships. Mm. Look, it's 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 a hard kind of it's a hard look at the market. I think in terms of I look at that market and think the relationships are great. I think that's that's one thing that you know particularly Lloyd's and London market is is phenomenal for. It's a face to face, knee to knee market. It has been for a long time. It's one of its strengths. Um, let's be honest, it's one of the things that people like about it a great deal. But I do think that sort of heavy technical skill set. Um, do you think we're going to see a very different profile of individual come into the market? Um, uh, don't, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just look at, you know, banking's always the lazy analogy, but I do think it kind of holds true. Like, you know, I've got family that are investing in banking and, you know, it was the classic 
cousin that didn't go to university and that ended up there through nepotism and then you know sailed for his career but at the start it was kind of all, all guys of a similar interest and now by the end he had a load of quants working for him and and, and no one else and uh you know do you think we're gonna we're going on a similar journey are, are we already going on that journey i wonder what your observation was around there so i would say that the underwriters that i know are super smart great people they are optimizing though okay constantly sounding like geek they're optimizing though for what has worked for them which is probably more the focus on relationships and how business has operated in the past so i think the changes which which are underwriters or the people that are willing to learn what the skills that they need in the, the new world i don't think that it's that you need completely new people or that you need uh a completely different skill set you just need to be willing to learn the new world because the the risk is that if they entirely refuse to do that then you will get somebody that's probably uh, a very well qualified and technical person coming into those roles because simply the the employers will will look to people that can do the things that we we spoke about before like encode things at the portfolio level work with technical people understand how the distribution comes from from people at scale and they will get pushed out but there's no reason I don't, I don't think there is a reason that they can't learn those skills themselves now no because i don't no. think they're going to be coding python models themselves so I don't, I don't think that all underwriters are going to be developers no 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 and i i, I completely agree and I, I think that portfolio moment is an interesting point i do wonder what it means for the enjoyment of the role um and and that's that's a cultural thing now we have what's defined as enjoyable about the role now um, does that change? I think we're both, you know, agreeing and, and saying that, you know, relationship and driving relationships can be a large part of it. So I'd like to think not, but I just reflect on some of the sort of bigger, more successful insurtechs that we work with in the US. Um, they are very heavy data science, algorithmically driven underwriting machines, you know, a lot of digital kind of MGAs. And they employ underwriters now that basically look after things that gets, you know, the human in the loop element. And we're already starting to see a sort of slight dissatisfaction with that because there's a sort of a removal from the humanization of the process. Um, so, but I don't think that, you know, that's not a piece of change that we can worry about. You know, we, we, I, I think we have to go, okay, what does it allow us to do? And, and that freedom of expression and new products thing is, is for me where the excitement comes in in utilizing that knowledge of that underwriter, that specialist, unique knowledge, particularly in the Lloyd's market. And saying, okay, how can we be really innovative about product? And then how do we how do we get ourselves to the front of the queue? And if we've got more time to do that, then it's a net positive. Even if there are kind of there will be these kind of moments of of friction where where some of the elements of enjoyment about the job may be taken away. But I think that chance to innovate is um, is is worth it. Um, yeah. yeah. Also. I think the, the type of people that underwriters are like highly driven results orientated orientated they like winning and if you can say to them you can win and you can win more hopefully that excites them <laughs> you'd like to think so yeah very right if it wasn't um I was going to ask you about you know because you, you obviously you straddle two sides of the fence being in insurance the insurance and, and the tech what we're talking about really is people's willingness to change um is, is that is that something you kind of that's super important uh, you know i know you're much more sort of mature business now but still relatively young in, in certainly in insurance terms um is that something you look for when hiring is, is, that, is that an important factor basically someone's ability to kind of operate in a sort of dynamic and changing environment yes if, if someone can operate in a dynamic changing environment that's always a positive uh, can't really think of how that's a negative i think we internally also struggle with change mm. I don't think insure techs are unique in their ability to to be super dynamic. I think in terms of the challenge of, of change across the board, the hardest part, I think, is when people agree to change and then don't change. Because mm -hmm. I think that you've got this kind of inner chimp situation where mm -hmm. the inner chimp doesn't want change, but you say, right, let's let's is this for the is this for the best? yes absolutely is this the right thing to say in the room i'm at at the moment yes absolutely and does it all make sense yes and then three weeks later you're in a meeting 
and you don't really want to do something and then you kind of chip away at that change because you're then slowly reverting back to the norm now that that doesn't happen at, at insurtech in relation to how you're writing insurance of course it happens in other ways but i think an insurance company the temptation is always there especially if somebody uh if a broker phones you up and says i need you to do this slightly outside of the norm but you're going to make more money out of it or i'm going to give you this other piece of business that's fantastic i don't think it's necessarily that do this mm. do x and i'll give you y i think it's more a case of this is a good piece of business, but it doesn't fit with algorithmic. You're going to have to slightly change how you operate. And I'm going to send you a, I'm going to walk around to your building and give you a contract and you're going to sign it and you're going to make a million pounds. Yeah. I'm signing that document to be fair. Like the, 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 the discipline that you need to have, because what yeah. happens is that's a, that's a, just a little nudge in the wrong direction. And then you give that contract to the, whomever it is that puts data in and they say well this is not how we operate this is this is just old insurance and i'm now going to have to rekey all this into the system and then the data points aren't going to be available and when the claims come in it's not going to tie up in the same way and you and you're slowly reverting and it's got like that cascading problem so i've mm -hmm. probably taken the this question to places that you didn't expect it but that mm -hmm. what i'm thinking is there's a difference between people being willing to change and then actually changing for the long term when uh they're faced with these challenges which might pro provide immediate benefits no 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 i think it's a really good answer to that question because i think i think you know i think it's very easy to roll out and so try to say yes we look for change and you know i think where, where i was going is that how do we how do i identify that but i think that's that you brought up a more important point which is it's very difficult to you know, I reflect that on my own. Like we have to sort of turn work down, and turning work down is the most important thing. You know, because you have to stick to the core of what you're good at. Um, but it's, you know, we're a small business, but even if we're a bigger business, I've worked for very large recruiting businesses that are under no threat whatsoever from a uh, perspective. But you, it's really hard to say no to some business that you with a client you like but it's just just off the center of what you do um but actually you, you, you're always better off kind of saying no but but it's but it's very difficult with those incentives and certainly no one was coming to me with a million pound check and if they were then they'll probably <laughs> i'd probably say yes a lot quicker um uh, i'm really conscious of time and one thing i wanted to ask you about particularly because you know we focus on innovation a lot on this podcast and when it's talked about the roles of accelerators and incubators um you know you you as a business were involved in the Pingang Accelerator, I believe. Um, yeah. And, and I suppose, like, what role do you think they, they play? Do you, you know, what do you think of the role of accelerators or incubators? You know, is it a useful one? And if so, why? What, what do they kind of bring to the table? So we've been fortunate enough to be through quite a few accelerators mm -hmm. and we've got different benefits from different accelerators and we've also thought some were good and some were bad. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is the Lloyd's Lab was very good. Yeah. Uh, Ping An was very interesting. Uh, so, and the others are just different places on that, that kind of on the spectrum to good to bad. The You asked me about Ping An specifically. I think what's absolutely great about the Ping An one was it gave us access to data very quickly. They had a lot of data that they could say, you can practice your uh, machine learning analysis and the, well, the data team can practice all sorts of different things using that data and then you can present the results back and then it gets validated quite quickly whether it's good or bad also the whether it's worthwhile the cultural element of uh, doing things at pace so like the pace that they expected you to operate was very fast and as an insure tech of course you should be operating very uh, rapidly as well but just that interaction with the, the on the having that from the insurance side because it was a number of years ago i think the insurers that we deal with now they are similar but at the time there was definite a difference from the what was going on in asia versus what was going on in london i think yeah london has changed slightly uh in terms of what we got from the accelerators in general i think when you're an early stage in short tech you need help understanding who to talk to, the terminology, how the market works, just the dynamics, the, the unsaid dynamics that you can't go onto a website or buy a textbook and it explains everything. 
Mm. I think you can cheat in some areas, like you can buy Stephen Catlin's book and read. I'm, I'm, I'm not a paid advert, uh, paid brand advocate for Stephen Catlin, but things like that you can read. But then there's also not the, the the human element of somebody saying to you in this particular area, this is what matters. These are the people you should talk to. And it all points to when you're in front of somebody. Now, English people are super polite, as we mentioned before, but really like why do I care I'm sitting in front of you why tomorrow when I'm doing something else am I going to remember you and I think the accelerators help you focus in on that I think the good ones do as well Mm -hmm. uh and then and it all builds towards that are we doing the right thing are we are we asking the right people for the feedback and do we have a business Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a bit. Uh, it's interesting as well. I think you made a really important point. So it's a bit pick your poison because I, I certainly speak to some earlier stage insurtechs and they're trying to get on any accelerator, and, and and it's definitely like, well, no, you want to access the ones that give you the answers to the questions that you've got. It sounds like, um, and then yeah, obviously there's some that are just, you do prestige and kind of awareness, and some you know like the Lloyd's app is a classic example. Like we're always talking about people in Lloyd's and and. and most people are turning up not really knowing anything about it, you know, it's particularly if they're not from the UK. And, um, and it's as much about understanding the sort of dynamics of that world and, and who to contact than, than anything else. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of, of, of most accelerators, but um, we can have an off-air conversation about the bad ones because that's, that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's a podcast for another day. Um, David, always want to finish with what's ahead. Um, you know, it's been a really exciting time for you guys and obviously raised, you know, raised a pretty significant amount of money fairly recently. Um, we're into, into the last quarter. What, what, what's going on for here? And then what, what's ahead for 2023? I think we're going to double down on what has been working for us today, which is focus and differentiating on the tech area. So we want to be really deep in algorithmic underwriting with a select number of partners where we can operate at scale and we believe we can do that q4 and into next year that is going to again require change tough decisions making people upset for to be blunt i think we just need to to carry on doing that and and keep our fingers crossed as well that the market moves towards algorithmic underwriting in certain areas and uh we continue to make good technology. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, I'm sure it will. Um, if there's anything to do by the, the inquiries I get about, no, uh, we've heard about this algorithm under right? we'd like we'd like to know more about it. Um, but I'm running out of people to send them, so I have to send them to you. Um, but um, David, thank you so much for being a guest. Um, I really appreciate it, particularly on a Friday as well, Friday afternoon. Is, um, you know, there's, there's better things to do for, than speak to me. Um, so I really, really do appreciate your time. And um, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. And I look forward to listening to all of your other guests in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Leadership and Insurance podcast. As ever, this is brought to you by FinPro Search Partners, the executive search firm for the insure tech industry on an international basis. If you want to find out more about what we do from a recruitment standpoint, please visit www.wearefinpro.com. 